A political assassination in July in the Democratic Republic of the Congo is yet another instance of the instability and chaos that the regime of President Felix Shisekedi has unleashed. What lies ahead for this country? The FIFA Women's World Cup continues in Australia and New Zealand and is quite well attended according to reports. What's been happening on the pitch and outside? We'll be looking at these stories in today's Daily Debrief. But as always, do hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. And on with the show. We go to the Democratic Republic of the Congo, or DRC, where opposition leader Sherubin Okende was assassinated a couple of weeks ago. Okende was an associate of Moise Katumbi, a former ally of the President Felix Shesekedi. But now Katumbi might contest against him in the national elections in December. Now Shesekedi claimed to be a democratically elected president, but his approach has been anything but. And there are even doubts about the conduct of the December elections. We go to Kambale Musawali for more. Kambale, thank you so much for joining us. So it's been a couple of weeks since uh, the assassination of Shirubin Okende and there's a lot of shock at that point of time. So could you maybe take us through, you know, what has happened since then, what have been, if, if, if any investigation has taken place and the kind of responses that have come out? The death of uh, Shirubin Okende, who is a member of parliament, uh, was shocking uh, to the entire Congolese people, um, especially how it happened. He was asked to come to the constitutional court uh, to declare his assets. Um, the court case was supposed to take place on the 13th. So he went on the 12th uh, to try to um, extend it, you know, ask uh, the court to give him more time uh, for that and asking for a court date for the 14th. As he went uh, to the court, uh, he never came back home, right? And he was found dead on the 13th with um, bullets in his body. Uh, the police has gone through um, investigation. They have not clearly uh, presented the cause of death. Uh, I mean, a body uh, with bullets uh, clearly was shot um, and killed. And there have been uh, eye eyewitnesses account um, about seeing him in the parking lot of uh, the constitutional court and also seeing his uh, bodyguard leaving the car, going inside, and then later seeing a truck uh, full of people, uh, some in military uh, clothing, out in plain clothes, um, kidnapping him. And these are you no know, allegations being presented by eyewitnesses. Uh, investigation um, has not continued, and the family, and including uh, the opposition in the Congo, they are not waiting for uh, what the investigation will lead. But who is Sheriba? Who was Sheriba Okende? Sheriba Okende. Uh, is a, was a member of the party of the political party called Ensemble, which is a opposition party led by a Congolese uh, billionaire uh, named Moïse Katumbi. So you kind of understand that it's mainly the political class, the political elite uh, running the country with a political party. Uh, but they have created a block in the opposition. Uh, they were first part of the majority in the country. The, they called it Union Sacré, the Sacred Union. Uh, with the regime of uh, Felix Shisekedi. Uh, but in uh, last year, sometime at the end of the year, uh, the Ensemble, the political party, broke away from the coalition. And uh, the leader of the party, Ensemble, Moïse Katumbi, um, decided, uh, to, he announced that he's going to be a presidential candidate at the next election. Uh, since that has happened, um, there's been attacked, um, at targeting are these uh, members? Um, one of uh, his members was arrested. Uh, we've claimed that he he was uh, allegedly he had a gun that was not registered. And today, uh, Sherubel Okende, who also left the majority coalition uh, to join Moïse Katumbi in, in the opposition, has been found dead. Uh, these are indications that the presidential election that is due at the end of this year. Is going to be more with a lot of violence. Uh, it's going to be more potentially with more uh, political assass assassination. Uh, hopefully that, that won't continue. But clearly, um, as days go by, uh, we are really worried um, on how the current regime is literally behaving as the former regime of uh, Joseph Kabila. 
um, which is quite astonishing, right? Because the president of the Congo uh, claims he's a Democrat, claims that uh, he is uh, a progressive um, on, on the left somehow, um, and and yet uh, his regime has repressive methods that we've seen before, you no know, um, arbitrary uh, arrests, political assassination, and uh, abuse of uh, civilians who are protesting. Uh, so we can only predict that either the election will not take place uh, due to the unwillingness of the Congolese government to organize it, or that it will be more with a lot of violence at the end of this year of 2024, uh, 2023. Uh, Kambale, it's very, uh, it's striking that you say that this reminds me, it reminds you of the violence of the Joseph Kabila years, because at that time we saw, you know, so many murders, so many attacks on activists, a lot of uh, horrors. But could you also tell us right now how people are responding in, sense, in the sense activists, civil society, etc., how they're responding to the Shishikedi regime and what it's trying to do? Specific for the case of uh, Okende, it's really uh, to compare it to what happened during the Joseph Kabila era. Uh, there was a, an activist, his, uh, his name was uh, Floribert Chebea. Um, he was called into the police department uh, a few years ago. Um, and as he was called into the police department, the next day he was found dead. So this political assassination has taken place in the past. But now, for beyond the comparison that's being made about the death of Sheribel Okende with Floribert Chebea, the population in the Congo, beyond the elections, are tired of the suffering they are facing. Uh, the cost of living has increased tremendously. Uh, this past week, in Kinshasa, uh, there is a, an activity that started. And this activity is called uh, Jeu de la Francophonie. It's almost like the Olympic Games of the Francophonie. Uh, the Francophonie is a body of Francophone countries, uh, con and these Francophone countries, just like the Commonwealth, host some type of games. I think the Commonwealth hosts similar type of uh, right. um, championship and so on. So for the first time in the history of Francophonie, this uh, started, all right, was launched in the DRC. So many countries are, are participating in it. Something very fascinating happened during that time. While the president of the Congo was there, but not only that, while the foreign minister was having a speech that, uh, at the commencement, at the beginning of the ceremony, while he, the, uh, the minister of foreign affairs was having a speech, the people were chanting in the local language, stating that they would like the value of the Congolese franc to actually decrease as it is paired to the dollar. Right, one dollar today has increased to 2,300 uh, 2, Congolese franc. In the Kabila era, I think around 2015 and 2016, one dollar was about 900 Congolese franc. So the cost of living has increased tremendously. People have challenges with buying uh, food, with paying rent, with paying electricity. Not only that, in the eastern part of uh, the Congo, we have a town and this town is called Bunangana, and the town of Bunangana, since last year, is no longer in the control of the Congolese government. It's being controlled by a rebel group called the M23. So the political instability, the security of the country, the cost of living, all of those things are actually making the Congolese people really angry. Uh, it's not that they had hope uh, that this government would do something different. Uh, why I'm saying this is because the people of the Congo are clear that they did not elect the president of the Congo today, Felix Shisekedi. He was announced as the winner of the election. He was presented as the winner. Uh, we have evidence today that there was a secret deal between the former president, Joseph Kabila, and Felix Shisekedi, uh, a deal to make sure that Joseph Kabila is not uh, arrested or his, uh, his uh, assets are not frozen, while there will be a coalition between uh, Felix Shisekedi and Kabila to rule the country. So we know he did not win the election. And this was documented in Jeune Afrique, uh, Africa Confidential, even African intelligence around uh, the secret deal signed in front of uh, Egypt, uh, Kenya, and South Africa. Now we are moving toward the elections. What do the Congolese people want? The Congolese people want what they wanted in 1885 
1960, in the 1990s, and today. They want to have a say to who is going to lead them. They do not want outside interference. They want to choose their leader and elect them democratically. The only chance they had to elect uh, a leader uh, democratically, and I, he actually worked, was in 1960, when they democratically elected Patrice Lumumba as the first prime minister of the Congo. Since the assassination of Lumumba by the CIA, uh, Belgium, and local Congolese sacrifice, Congolese have not been able to choose their leaders. And because they are not being able to choose their leaders and leaders are imposed, these leaders are coming up with neoliberal policies uh, that affect the country tremendously. For example, getting large sum from the World Bank and IMF in terms of billions of dollars, which is now going to help the DRC. Uh, if you look at the numbers uh, from the World Bank today with the funding that have, have provided the DRC in the past four years, you cannot see the impact it actually has made. They've given Congo over $3 billion. There is no impact. The cost of living is increasing. So we know uh, that this is not working. So the Congolese people will continue to fight until they can choose their leaders. But for the foreseeable future, uh, future uh, the challenge is the image that the president of the Congo uh, presents to the world. He presents himself as the first democratically uh, elected president of the Congo uh, with peaceful transfer of power. Uh, that's an insult to the thousands of Congolese who died during the elections. It was not a peaceful transfer of power. We, rem we remember the Luc Kulula, the Rossi Chimanga, these young Congolese who were shot and killed uh, in the streets. Uh, for the case of uh, Luc Kulula, he was burned in his house, alive. You know, he died in his house through, uh, with fire in his house. These young people who died to see a democratic election to take place in 2018, uh, it will not be fair to say that uh, this was a peaceful transfer of power and also that it was a democratic election because we know it was rigged. But as Patrice Lumumba uh, said in his last letter, the Congolese will not stop uh, to fight until the last neo-colonial agents of imperialists are out of the Congo. And that's what the Congolese people continue to do. And what they are calling for as they are fighting on the inside of the country, they hope that people on the outside of uh, the Congo will join them in this struggle so that they can put pressure on the outside forces while Congolese are dealing with their local compradors. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Kambale, for, I think, giving us a, la the larger picture of what is happening in the DRC right now, especially with elections less than half a year away. Thank you so much. For our second story, we head to Australia and New Zealand where the FIFA Women's World Cup is going on. Now, there's been pretty good attendance in many of the matches, which is a positive sign, and quite a few close contests, which is also great. Stantane, who's in Australia, brings us the latest from the pitch and outside. Sidan, thank you so much for joining us. So, uh, let's first take a look at what has been happening on the pitch. Quite a few interesting matches, you know, I think the hosts also uh, have been in some interesting situations. So, could you maybe first take us through what have been the key matches? Are they going on the lines of pretty much what was expected? Uh, uh, thanks for having me, uh, Prashant. Yeah, it's been really interesting. As you know, we, we were talking about it a little bit the last time as well. 32 team tournaments. Uh, end up in the last round of matches uh, being, you know, uh, quite interesting to watch from a neutral perspective particularly. And uh, FIFA added a little bit to that drama by sending out an email to the press corps uh, a day before saying, you know, in case all, uh, there are multiple teams that are tied on points and all the other criteria, we'll have a draw of lots, uh, like a coin toss to figure out who goes through to the next round. So it was built up as... Uh, but, but from there on, I think... Uh, Again, tournament football revealed itself. Uh, so, the strong teams got stronger uh, when there was a clear objective. Uh, they've also now spent a bit more time together, the players, that is, uh, they're used to the kind of systems they want to play. I think uh, one big uh, big one was Japan versus Spain. Uh, uh, again, both in their own ways, quite power, powerhouses in, 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 the, in women's football particularly. Uh, but they had an interesting game at the Men's World Cup as well in Qatar. And uh, and here, it was kind of like a, a group deciding uh, match. And and with uh, less than a quarter of ball possession, uh, Prashant, uh, Japan ended up 4-0 uh, winners in that game. Uh, 
in a complete it was a complete sort of tactical masterclass so the perfect game of uh, organized uh, sort of a collective football that that you can possibly uh, ask for from from a group of 11 12 13 players uh, so so in that sense uh, it, it was interesting to see also some of the japanese people uh, who are here covering uh, the sport uh, talking about how different it is from what's happening in domestic politics where there's a push towards uh, like uh, sort of more polarized kind of approach uh, the the right is 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 pushing you know uh, there, there's a, a sort of conversations around pacifism and those things are happening well but as far as football is concerned whether it's the men's team who we, we were lucky to talk to also uh, in qatar and they said they've been learning so much from from the women's squad because they've actually won the world cup back in 2011 been in the finals in 2015 uh, so in that sense for asian football these are like the torch bearers uh, and and that's been really great to see that they are maintaining that competitiveness because out, other than the japanese uh, then the gaps are quite evident between players who are based in europe and north america and teams which have more of those uh, tend to emerge uh, stronger in the end so like england was 6 uh, 6-1 up over uh, china uh, as we when we started recording uh, and uh, some of the strong european teams doing well france have emerged as another very strong uh, contender Uh, and a couple of others but it's quite open and it's going to be a really really uh, keenly contested round of 16 uh, to come uh, prashant so if you haven't gotten into the tournament yet now is a great time to sort of jump on the bandwagon right sidant of course and as usual i think it's also for us uh, interesting to take a look at some of the conversations happening outside the pitch as well you know tournaments are always a very good time to sort of talk about the larger politics of sport which otherwise does not get talked about or covered so much yeah yeah Uh, and yeah not just sport also prashant because one of the big conversations right now of course and daily debrief i think is among uh, probably the few uh, of, of sort of international programming that has covered some of these issues but whether it's the defamation case uh, of uh, robert smith or uh, it's the indigenous voice to parliament i mean these are the big talking points in australia as far as uh, politics is concerned uh, at the moment and we've seen like now mention of uh the uh, first nations names or the old names for these places uh, sydney gadigal and all of that so th- there's uh, a lot of sort of gesture being made to the first nations the indigenous people in australia but uh in terms of how that will play out politically and socially uh it's a quite interesting time to have those conversations and i think some of that is happening uh, also around uh, this tournament because you've had you know Uh, it, it's out to an international audience uh, those uh, at least some lip service is being paid at the beginning of uh, games and and things like that so so it's important also i think for people i mean we have a situation going on in india as well where you know, the tribe tribal communities are involved so people also get a sense of uh, the similarities that that you know different kinds of uh, communities minority communities around the world are facing Uh, so that that way it's been, it's been interesting i mean uh, uh, also to talk to some of the journalists uh, around here um uh, from a footballing sense uh, again the the diversity in the audience has been uh, remarkable and it's and it's kind of building on uh, what we saw in qatar uh, so uh, very mixed very diverse lots of sort of age uh, a big, big age uh, chunk from very young to to quite senior uh, people coming to watch the games and and all sold out more than a million people have now been to stadiums to watch the tournament i mean you have some 70 odd thousand seater stadiums selling out when australia are not even playing so it kind of reflects also the the the, the interest that has uh, emerged uh, as the tournament has gone on and and the finals already sold out for example so uh, yeah so so it's going to be uh, again a couple of interesting uh, more weeks to come and i think we'll have more updates soon absolutely thank you so much siddhant i think we'll definitely come back in a few days especially close to the round of 16 or once it starts to get a sense of some more sense of which are the key teams to watch out for who are the surprises etc thank you so much for talking to us and and very important that i guess australia stay, stayed on in the tournament because that that would have been a real dampener new zealand are out as co-hosts uh, but at least australia still being in the tournament keeps uh, the kind of momentum going so that absolutely. that's another good one right. 
चलो थैंक यू सो मच दे एंड दैट्स ऑल वी आर टाइम फॉर इन टूडेज एपिसोड डू कीप वॉचिंग विल बी ब्रिंग यू स्टोरीज फ्रॉम अक्रॉस द वर्ल्ड अक्रॉस सेक्टर्स द स्ट्रगल्स ऑफ पीपल द एजेंडा ऑफ एंटी इंपीरियलिज्म सो मेनी स्टोरीज बट डू हिट दैट सब्सक्राइब बटन इज वेल इफ यू हैव इन टॉलरेडी एंड सी यू टूमोरो Thank you.